Hi there, it's Scott Nicholson, Associate Professor at Syracuse University's School of Information Studies. Welcome to session number 12 of the Gaming and Libraries course. Now, today I'm going to be talking about strategy game experiences. So, over the last few days I've been talking about different types of game experiences from my snacks algorithm, strategy, narrative, action, knowledge, and social. And so today I'm going to talk about strategy game experiences. Now, these types of games are things that have been in libraries for a long time, as I talked about in my history video, since the 1850s. Games like chess, you know, have been around for a long time in libraries. So the concept of having a strategy game in the library is not a new one. Now, to refresh your memory, when I talk about strategy game experiences, I'm talking about games that emphasize your decisions on what to change in the game state. So when you're playing with someone else, you make some decisions about what to change, and these are games that emphasize that decision-making process. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Again, I'm focusing on multiplayer games. And I'm focusing, uh, so I'm not really going to talk much about single player games because most of the library gaming experiences are about bringing people together and engaging with each other. Now, I should give you a note first. I am biased when it comes to these types of games. I have a long history in playing strategy games and strategy board games. And I in, I've found a lot of enjoyment and benefit in both the social interactions and the way it develops your mind. So I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, those types of games. I'm going to try to avoid giving long laundry lists of games because these games go out of print. But I'll give you a few examples to get you going so that you can go into a game shop and say, hey, I'm looking for something like Block. Can you tell me what's currently available? That's one of the challenges here of giving you specific game recommendations is games go out of print. First, I'll talk about abstract games. Now, there's two types of abstract games I'm going to discuss. The first one are games that are in the public domain, like chess, checkers, uh, backgammon, go. These are games that a lot of people know that they're very comfortable in library spaces. They're quiet experiences. And so they also have groups that are in your community that you can tap to bring in to help you teach and run these sorts of games. And so having traditional abstract games is, is a fairly inexpensive way to get started. But there are also modern abstract games. And so there's a whole series of games, for example, called GIF. This is one of the games in that series called Yinch. Um, this one, I think, is the best starting game. These are two-player abstract games that are very clever. They do some really neat things. And so if you're interested in looking at different abstract games, I'd suggest look at the series of GIPF, G-I-P-F. There are six games in that series. There is an umbrella organization for abstract games out there called IAGO, the International Abstract Games Association. They're focused on two-player abstract games. But uh, the, what they're trying to do is work toward making a list of places where people can go to play these types of games. And so they're looking to begin to reach out to libraries. The next type of game I'll talk about are card games. Now we've got, again, the same categories. We've got public domain card games, things like Bridge and Spades and Hearts and Rummy. Again, these are games a lot of people know how to play, and they're really inexpensive. A library looking to start a gaming program with just uh, you know chess and checkers and go and card games can get that started for not much money at all, and a lot of people already know how to play these types of games. But there are a lot of modern card games as well that can be nice additions. Now, one card game that's very popular with teenagers is a game called Flux. This is the Monty Python brand of Flux. Flux is a very simple game. You start the game by drawing a card and playing a card. Um, and the game cards have additional rules and goals of the game. So you start with no goal, but someone has to play a card which gives you a goal. But it's called Flux. It's a very random game, but it's one that uh, teens really like a lot. So if you're looking to draw on teens, I'd suggest getting a copy of Flux. If you're looking for a slightly more serious card game, there's a good one called No Thanks. No Thanks is a light card strategy game. It takes about 20 minutes and is a good filler game while people are between other activities. Now, if you're looking to get a little more complex, there's a game that's very popular amongst people who are serious about games called Teach You. Teach You is a ladder game. It's a partner game, and it's called a ladder game because what will happen is I'll play something, and you have to play something higher, and he has to play something higher, and she has to play something higher, etc. And so it's, it's, it feels like Bridge as far as it being a team-based game, a more serious game, uh, but is a very interesting strategy game that you might want to explore. Now, long lines of card games are collectible card games. And so I've talked a little bit about these before. Things like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Magic the Gathering. These are very popular games, especially with uh, kids and young adults. And the library actually doesn't have to spend any money to have a collectible card game day because people bring their own sets. The way these collectible card games work is they're like baseball cards. So you buy them in small packs and then you trade with each other. So the library can create a trading card day. They could create a tournament. They could have it where people bring their own stuff. There's actually 
already tournaments out there. Again, earlier I pointed you to the Wizards Play Network, and they're involved with Magic the Gathering and trying to get up tournaments at libraries and library settings. So there's actually a whole tournament structure out there for these games. So collectible card games are a way of doing strategy game experiences that, again, don't cost a lot of money because the library can just invite people to bring their own stuff. Now, the library may want to have some cards available for people to try out the game if they don't have it. So now let's talk a little bit about board games. So we've got some public domain board games, things like Parcheesi, and you've got the mass market games, things like uh, Monopoly and Clue and Risk, games like that, which are inexpensive and a lot of people know how to play them, but there are better choices out there. And then you've got these designer board games. Now I'm going to be talking about these designer board games both today and then a bit later in the narrative day. And here's what's going on. So in the world of board games, there's really two camps that have developed. There are games that are focused more on the mechanics and then games that are focused more on the underlying story and the theme. And so today I'm going to focus on those games that, are, that have come out of the European game design element. Uh, many people call them Euro games that are focused more purely on the mechanics. They may have some theme, they may have some narrative, but it's really about resource management and manipulating uh, time and turns and each other and making paths on the board and doing spatial connections. In a couple days, when I talk about narrative games, I'm going to talk about narrative board games. Out of an American style of developing games, we have a lot of games out there that are focused more on the theme. They still have strategy elements, but they really focus on immersing you in a story, a story about vampires or a story about space combat or something like that. And so the, that's actually, those games have gotten the term Ameritrash, which I don't care for that term. I'm going to use the term narrative board games, and I'll talk a lot about those games in a couple days when I talk about narrative games. Now, early on the Analog Games episode, I pointed you to Board Games 101. That's a good place to look to learn about these basic concepts of board games. Um, I talked about Blocus as a good example, something to start with. A lot of people know the game Ticket to Ride is a good game to start with. If you're looking to support a racing game, there's a new one that's really nice called Formula D. I've got an episode of Board Games with Scott on it here that's about driving your cars around a track. Uh, one of the more advanced games that takes you into this world of Euro games is a game called Puerto Rico, which the problem with a game like Puerto Rico it takes about 90 minutes to two hours to play. It's not a simple game to learn, but it's very immersive. And once people start playing these types of games, they'll get engaged with them. I talked earlier about the concept of bait games. And so those are games like Ink and Gold and Hey, That's My Fish and Blocus falls into that category, um, Suro. Uh, things like that are, these are great introductory games to strategy games that are not that difficult. They're easy to pick up and easy to get engaged with. So I'm going to stop myself there because I could go on about these sorts of board games for a very long time. But no, there's an entire world of strategy board games. And I'll revisit this when I talk about narrative games in a few days. Now, another type of game are battle games or conflict games, games that are about two sides that are fighting it out. Now, in getting into these games, there's a few introductory battle games I'll talk about. A lot of people know about Risk already. Memoir 44 is a good example of a game for two people or there's some interesting team variants, which is a card-driven game which has two sides battling it out uh, in a World War II setting. A similar game in the fantasy side of things is called Battle Lore, and again, it's armies fighting it out. A interesting game that I've used in libraries is a game called Heroescape. Now this is Marvel Super Heroes Heroescape, but Heroescape is actually set in a lot of different worlds. There's a basic set of Heroescape where you get terrain and you get figures and you get everything you need to really make an impressive display. I've seen when I set up Heroescape in a library gaming activity, the boys between say 9 and 12 come rushing over and will just play with it because it can be played with as a toy but also has all the rules of the game. I've also got an episode of Board Games with Scott on Heroescape here. I'd highly recommend Heroescape as a game of getting people started in this type of miniatures games. And if you're looking for something a little more serious, uh, Commands and Colors Ancients is a more serious version of Memoir 44. And so if you're looking for something more for adults, that's a good game to look at. If you don't want to spend a lot of money, but you want to have this types of miniature game experience, it's a game called Battleground Fantasy Warfare. And what it has is rather than you having to purchase all of these little miniatures, you have cards that have pictures of the miniatures. And so you put the cards with the pictures on the miniatures on either side of the battlefield, and there's pictures of terrain and all of that. And it plays just like a miniatures game, but it's much, much cheaper. So again, for a library looking to explore, now I'll warn you, it's complex. It's, it's, it's uh, not as complex as some of these games get, but it's more complex than Ticket to Ride or something like that. But if you're looking to get, engage in that type of game, that's a good place to start. So now I'll talk about electronic strategy games. Now, one problem is that 
some of the best electronic strategy games out there, like Civilization or Age of Mythology. Uh, these games are designed to be played by one player or by a number of players hooked together over an, a network, each on their own computer, which, if you've tried to do that in a library with a firewall, can be fairly frustrating, and many times you have to have a copy of the game for each computer you want to have. So those types of games, while they fit very well into the category, don't tend to give you <clears throat> the multiplayer experience where everyone's in the same room playing along. But there are a few games that will work. One game is called Worms, and there's a whole series of Worms games. And the idea on these Worms games is that you play an army of worms, and on your turn you pick one of your worms, and you have your worms shoot, and you set the angle at which they're going to shoot and the weapon at which they're going to use. And so it's a strategy game. You're all, it's all about making plans and choosing angles and things like that. Many of the board games I just talked about, Ticket to Ride and Carcassonne and Settlers of Catan, are available on Xbox Live as a game that multiple people can play sitting around the same computer. But they also have one called Age of Booty. Now, Age of Booty is a lighter strategy game. It's got a few action game elements, but it's really more of a strategy game. It's more about deciding what to do. It's about resource management, and it's available. You download it through Xbox Live. You can have up to four people together on the same Xbox playing the game at the same time. So it'd be a good pick for a strategy game experience. I have a video about that on my Scott Stuff video blog here. Another game is called Boom Blocks. Boom Blocks is for the Wii, and the nice thing about Boom Blocks is it has a lot of different modes. And so some modes are more live action modes, but other modes are more strategy modes, where you plan things out and you, you use strategy to figure out how you're going to throw balls at each other's castles to take them down. So it's a nice addition to this type of game. Now I talked about collectible card games earlier. There's an electronic game which will work in the same way and there's a Pokemon electronic games that are very popular. Many, many kids have Pokemon electronic games and they've built up and collected Pokemon in their world. And then you can set a time at the library where people can come together and trade Pokemon electronically. And they can also battle them and you can have shared battles on a screen and you can do things like that. But it's again, it's more of a single player experience. You're just providing an opportunity for people to know when they can come together and engage with each other. Another type of electronic game that falls in this category are tower defense games. So in tower defense games, what you're doing is there's going to be a string of monsters coming to attack a home base. And you're running around the board and trying to place defenders at certain points. Now, some of these games, like Pixel Junk Monsters for the PlayStation 3, allows people to cooperate as they're building up these defenses. And so this is a really nice multiplayer strategy game that can be done electronically. In the last episode, I talked about puzzle games. Well, puzzle games fit here as well. Uh, they are based upon your prior knowledge and understanding algorithms of solving puzzles, but they're also based upon dealing with the current situation. And these categories I'm presenting are not mutually exclusive. They're not designed to be. The idea is that you say, well, given our library goals, and given our gaming goals, we want to have a strategy game experience, so here are some things to pick. It may be that for different goals, you want to pick the same games because they fulfill different needs. Like a puzzle, puzzle games can fit both in knowledge games and strategy games. So I'll be talking more about that, about those overlap of types of games that work well to meet different types of gaming experiences. So why have a strategy game experience? Well, they're quieter experiences. They're also fairly easy to justify because strategy games are based around things like resource management and planning. There's a lot of real life skills that are actually developed through playing these strategy games where you're learning how to make efficient decisions and how to make long-term plans and how to make tactical decisions that help you implement a long-term strategy. So there's a lot that can be taught through these types of game experiences, and they do tend to work well in a library setting. We also have a long history of doing them. And so if you're looking again to get started, strategy game experiences can work well. Now, if you're looking for a guide to this world of board games, I'd say look in your local community for a board game group. There are groups that either may meet in people's houses or may meet in a local board game store, and folks who would be willing to bring their board games to show you a variety of games and help you decide which ones are going to be appropriate. They would be willing to come and teach you things, maybe even run a demonstration, because many of these clubs are looking to grow and increase membership. And so some of these clubs are actually looking for a place to meet. Now, one of the challenges is that if your public library closes at 9 p.m. or earlier, these board game groups and other gaming groups probably want to go a bit later into the evening, and so that's going to be a challenge for them. But reach out to your local game stores and your local game clubs to ask them to help you explore this world of strategy games. I've given you a few tips here. I'm not going to give you a laundry list. There's a lot of good stuff over at Board Game Geek, which has a wide variety of information about these games, lots of reviews. It is the authoritative source on the world of strategy games out there. 
Think of Board Game Geek like OCLC for board games. It's this large worldwide cooperative where people can contribute a lot of information. So it's a great resource. So I'll rein myself in at that. Uh, hopefully I've given you a few ideas and things you can explore further. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about the action game experience, which is about actually making the changes in the game state as compared to making the decisions about what you want to change. And again, a number of the action games have strategy game elements. And I'll talk about that more tomorrow. So that's it. Thank you much. Again, if you're enjoying this, please tell other people about it. I'm trying to get the word out about this class, so let folks know. Send them to the site. Get people involved with what's going on. You can talk about today's episode over here at ALA Connect. Please go on there. Tell me about things I forgot. Tell me about things that have worked well in your library. Uh, share that with everyone else that's engaged with the class. But that's enough for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>